morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be hosting this event today. The 20th anniversary of 9-11, DHS has its eye off the ball. I'm joined today by Chad Wolf, Heritage Visiting Fellow and form, former Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, and Chris Wecker, retired FBI Assistant Director. We begin the week of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and with that, We'll be focusing for this event on domestic terrorism, which is just not a subject many are talking about. And so there's a lot to cover, and we're going to jump right in. So Chris, the first question is for you. What is domestic terrorism, and what isn't it? Well, I'll give you this, the definition that comes from the US Criminal Code. It's, it's fairly formal, but it, it's basically any act of uh, violence or, or danger, any act that's dangerous to human life that's intended to intimidate a c civilian population or influence the policy of a government. So it's basically commi committing crimes that, that are intended to force your ideology on a population, on a government. Now what it's not, it's not the exercise of your First Amendment rights, your, your right to assemble, your right to speak your mind, it only becomes domestic terrorism when it, when it crosses that line, if you will, to some sort of criminal or violent act with that intent to intimidate the, the population and, and influence policy. So before 9-11, what role did domestic terrorism have in the U.S., and, and who had the authority to uh, prevent it and to investigate it? Yeah, if you, if you look at the different decades over the years, you, know, you look at the, the 60s, the 60s were about sort of uh, left-wing anar anarchist-type activities, the weather underground. They committed uh, over 2,000 bombings in that time frame. The Students for a Democratic Society, uh, again, an anarchist group, a, a lot of uh, crimes towards property damage, bombings, and that sort of thing. The FALN, the Puerto Rican Separatist Group, uh, uh, actually... Uh, attack the Capitol during that time frame. Uh, not, not a lot of, at that point, there was some Klan activity, if you will, on the right wing extremist side, but it, it was not a very active time period for the right wing extremists. The 70s, uh, I mean the 80s, uh, you started to see more militia activity. You started to see more, uh, more on the sovereign citizen, anti-government, sort of on the right side. Uh, and we, we had quite a few incidents that occurred, standoffs, if you will, people trying to uh, take over property, rejecting the right of the federal government to come in and, and do anything in their areas. The 90s became more about international terrorism. We started to see Al-Qaeda form up. We saw the World Trade Center bombing in 93. Um, there was also a very active time for anti-abortion, Eric Rudolph, uh, the Olympic bombing, et cetera. The, the activists or the extremists in, in, on that side. So we started to see the, the budding international terrorism, if you will, in the 90s, and also a good deal of activity on the right side. And then we get into 9-11, uh, and that was a game changer. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that today. But 9-11 changed everything completely, and that's when DHS was formed up. Prior to that time, the FBI was the lead agency for counterterrorism investigations. They still are, but DHS uh, became a composite, a consolidation of, of quite a few agencies, Secret Service, Customs, Immigration, et cetera, Coast Guard. Um, and they, they came in in the area of, of intelligence, uh, protecting the borders. They have jurisdictions that, that you know, check and addresses that have some limitations, but it, um, I think probably, probably the greatest limitation maybe is the boots on the ground investigations squarely in the area of counterterrorism. You worked at a DHS in the early years. Was the intent for DHS to take on domestic terrorism? Well, no. The you know uh, DHS was focused shortly after 9/11 on stopping another terrorist attack. Um, you have to think about the mindset back then was we were going. Everyone believed we were going to be hit again by Al Qaeda, and the question was if it wasn't going to be in the aviation context, what other context was it going to be in? And so the early days after 9/11 was really focused on preventing another terrorist attack. It wasn't really looking internally. I think as the years went on and the threat starts to change a little bit, the manner in which people communicate, the internet starts to explode, social media starts to explode. We start having success uh, overseas, um, particularly with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Their ability to reach the homeland here is limited. 
but what that brings up or uh, is the ability to inspire individuals, Americans here that have always been here to do um, you know, dangerous acts, violent acts. And so that it's that inspiration that DHS then becomes involved in and how do we address that and how do we resolve that? A couple of, of points I wanted to, to touch on from Chris's perspective. The, when you talk about domestic terrorism, I think the ideology is very, very important because that's how people identify you know, what is a domestic terrorist event or non-event. What we saw at DHS, because we are the largest law enforcement agency in the country, is that we had a lot of our stakeholders, a lot of local law enforcement that would come to us and say, yeah, we're very much worried about domestic terrorism, but we're also worried about these violent activities that are taking place in our community. So from a DHS perspective, we started talking about domestic terrorism and targeted violence. Because you can have targeted violence, you could have individuals um, doing violent acts in schools or at you know, a, a, your place of business that may not have an ideology behind it, uh, but is, is taking that to the, the next stage of violent stage. And so we had a lot of our stakeholders approach us as a department and say, what can we do about that? We don't think it fits into that domestic terrorism because they're not going after an ideology. They're not trying to uh, change the political winds here in the U.S., but these are violent acts that our communities are involved in. So we came out with a strategy, a domestic terrorism and targeted violence strategy that said we're interested in addressing both of these from the prevention perspective. Um, so I would keep that in mind. That's certainly somewhere that the department has been. I do agree with Chris that you know the department's authorities are limited as far as boots on the ground. We, we don't really investigate nor do we prosecute uh, these types of events. That's almost exclusively uh, the Bureau's job to do that. But we are a partner. Uh, we do provide investigative tools and resources when called upon. And then our primary mission at the department is really that counterterrorism. What are all the tools and resources that we do? We vet a lot of individuals coming into the country. We screen a lot of individuals. We provide capacity building for allies uh, overseas. We give them the capability to screen and vet individuals coming into their country, pinging off of some of our holdings. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do on that counterterrorism side that gets towards keeping bad people out of the country um, and keeping that, that inspired event that I talked about earlier, trying to limit that. But the rise of the internet, social media, and the ability to do that online is really, really challenging. I think not only from a bureau perspective, but also from a, a DHS perspective. So over the past 18 years since DHS has existed, have you seen, Chris, uh, an increase of DHS handling or involvement in domestic terrorism? Oh, no, no question about it. That, that's why they were created. Um, you, you see a heavy, heavy involvement on the intelligence side because 9-11 was perceived to be a failure in, of intelligence, failure to connect the dots for the government across the board, but the FBI took a pretty heavy hit. And one of the, one of the raps was they didn't share information, they didn't connect up the information, the information didn't get where it needed to go. They needed uh, an agency or a body that could coordinate all of that intelligence, state and local police departments, the intelligence services, all the federal agencies. There are many people that would be surprised at how many federal law enforcement agencies are out there conducting investigations. They needed an agency to pull all that together, and DHS has played the, the primary role in that regard. It, it's about prevention, as Chad mentioned. I mean, it was, it was nice in 1993 when the FBI could investigate the World Trade Center bombing and quickly solve it, the Oklahoma City bombing, quickly solve the case, you know, uh, bring the subjects and the perpetrators to justice. That doesn't help. You know, it's good for deterrence, but it, the, the nation, Congress, uh, we, everybody wanted the agencies to get to the left side of, of a terrorist attack, try to prevent it. And they've been extremely successful in doing that. Much of it has been, you know, this global war on terrorism, the GWAT, uh, under the Bush administration, which continued until fa fairly recently. And that was about going upstream and finding terrorists in places outside our borders where conspiracies were being plotted, capabilities, training, et cetera. So you know, I think we really diminished the capacity of Al Qaeda, ISIS, international terrorist organizations to project themselves into the United States, except by what Chad mentioned, the lone wolf, the, the, the inspired um, and perhaps the disturbed, mentally disturbed individuals who grab onto that ideology 
and, and grab some readily accessible weapon, a car, a truck, uh, an AK-47, and, and conduct a terrorist attack that's inspired overseas. But that's, that's been the limit uh, to terrorist, international terrorist activity here in the United States. Have you seen any mission creep, do you think, by DHS? Is it, are they too much in the domestic terrorism? I don't know that it's too much. Uh, as Chris indicated, the primary role of the department is to share information, share information that they're getting, um, open source information, and any intelligence, classified intelligence, to turn that around to our state and local partners. And they do that through a fusion center network. So there's 40, 50 fusion centers out there, maybe a few more, um, that we interface with local law enforcement. Uh, the Bureau and others are all in those fusion centers so that we're sharing all of that information. And so over time, um, you want to push as much information. Now, what I saw at the department is there's always this balance, right? And so you always want to balance the, the, the threat of terrorism, the threat of foreign terrorist organizations, and some of the core competencies that the department has done for the last 20 years with the new threat, and the new threat being domestic terrorism. And I would find that some of the intelligence analysts and others wanted to push out more and more information on the new threat. And so one would say, the more information you put it, that must be the, the largest threat facing the country. That wasn't always the case. It was just that was the new threat, and so everyone was chasing the shiny object, more or less. Um, and so you would get a sense that that was the prevailing threat against the United States and the homeland, when in fact there are many, many threats um, that we have to guard against every single day. Um, so. I think there's always the case to have a little bit of the mission creep. Um, but again, DHS's mission in this space, which I had to remind folks, uh, are based, you know, at the department, we would do what our authorities allowed us to do. And so sharing information, providing prevention grants, and doing a few other things, investigating at the behest or with our partners, we could do. Outside of that, the authorities of, of, the, of the department are fairly limited. In 2020, we had uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, uh, Infinity Groups, uh, rioting, looting um, daily. And as that was going on, DHS put out a uh, threat assessment. Uh, what should the audience know about that threat assessment, and is it being accurately portrayed and, and carried out by this administration? So strangely enough, in the you know, almost 20-year history of DHS, that was the first annual threat assessment uh, that we produced. And it was strange because I would often ask folks, particularly our intelligence, you know, what are the major threats facing the homeland? And there was never one document. There was never one assessment that was provided. It was always drawing upon all these other entities that had different views of, of how to protect the homeland. So it's a useful document. It's supposed to be updated. Uh, every year, hopefully, uh, the new administration will continue that. Um, and so what did it do? It outlined a number of threats facing the United States and the homeland. Uh, China, terrorism, uh, from both domestic terrorism as well as foreign terrorist organizations, transnational criminal organizations, cybersecurity. It gave the whole range of threats facing the homeland, natural disasters, the whole range of threats facing the homeland. And really at the top, or not really at the top, but probably the most serious one was the threat from China to various aspects of the homeland. And um, what was embedded in that assessment was a, a discussion about domestic terrorism. Um, within that domestic violent extremist category, we then talked about a, a, a sliver of that being white supremacist extremists um, and talking about the lethality, just if you count the number of attacks over a, a two-year period talking about the lethality of that, and folks have blown that out of proportion. And I've even seen, the, unfortunately, the president, um, President Biden, talk about how white extremist domestic terrorism is the, is, the, is the most serious threat facing the United States, and that's simply not true. It's not accurate. It's not what the assessment says. You need to read the assessment, uh, and, uh, because there's a, a range of other threats. Uh, most notably, now it looks like we've got you know, terrorist groups reconstituting themselves in Afghanistan. So, there's a, a range of threats. So I encourage people. It is an unclassified document. I think most people should read it. it, it's, it the goal was to give the American public an idea of the threats facing the homeland in an unclassified nature, and I think it does a pretty good job. Oh, I just wanted to add, I've, I've read that, that assessment, and it's, it's very comprehensive. And it, it is a, a really good read because it lays out what the most serious threats are uh, strategically to this country, China trying to steal our technology and become dominant economically, stealing all of our technology. 
um, Russia, Iran, nuclear powers out there, uh, transnational criminal organizations, cyber crime, cyber groups can disrupt the power grid, they can do tremendous damage, cyber terrorism. So when you put it in a, it puts it in a, in a much broader perspective than just the myopic, let's look at domestic terrorism. And to say that domestic terrorism is the greatest threat to our homeland is a gross false statement. So what's the FBI's approach um, for strategizing for domestic terrorism? Does it do a, a long range view or a shorter time period? Well, with regard to terrorism in general, it's a more strategic long range view and that, and that would be with international, should be with international terrorism always in scope as the dominant terrorism threat. But you know, their, their challenge on the ground is to, is to gather intelligence and penetrate these groups, get human intelligence, get you know, intelligence from all different kinds of, of sources, and then use investigations to disrupt undercover operations, other types of uh, you know, wiretapping, legal wiretapping. Um, there, but I'll tell you, I know this from a, a personal experience. I worked the Eric, Eric Rudolph case, the Olympic bombing. I've worked many domestic terrorism cases, ran the field office in North Carolina. Domestic terrorism is very difficult to work because it's very hard to get sources inside the organization. It's very hard to get intelligence. And I'm afraid right now that, that the agencies are relying a, a lot on social media. You know, they can't just surf social media looking for threats but they can when they have some predication to do so, a report or someone, you know, some indication that there's some sort of criminal activity afoot. But uh, I think their challenge, and I, th I think we saw it in, in, uh, in the last year or so, is getting inside the organizations legally, running, running operations, and gathering enough intelligence to be effective in disrupting the next domestic terrorist attack. That's really difficult now because of the loan you know, we know now that, and, and I think it's accurate in all of the threat assessments that have been out over the last couple of years, it's the lone actor who's inspired, who has maybe a chaotic ideology, who is, may have some mental problems or some crises in their life. They grab onto this ideology and they go out and commit a, a violent act. So it's a tremendously challenging area for law enforcement in general. So there are some members in Congress who are seeking a statute for uh, domestic terrorist organizations. Question to both of you, I'll start with you, Chad. Do, is one needed? Well, I think it's a, it's a debate worth having. Um, my personal opinion would be, I, I don't see the benefit to it specifically. I don't think that uh, whether it's uh, the Bureau or DOJ or anyone is, is at a loss for how to prosecute these individuals that are doing these violent acts. I think the crimes that are on the books, that are in statute right now, they can charge them um, to the extent that they need. Um, and then I worry about the, you know, the just honestly the politics of it. So you have a domestic terrorism statute, then you have to start identifying and labeling different groups as domestic terrorists. And that becomes very difficult when you talk about First Amendment uh, here in the U.S. It's, it's very, uh, it's, it's a more logical process to designate, F, you know, foreign terrorist organizations under that, that type of uh, statute. But when you're talking about internal groups that perhaps haven't done anything violent yet, but are talking about it um, and doing other things, again, it, it bleeds over into that First Amendment. So I would be very careful about, about that because I think that's a slippery slope. But I think first someone needs to point to uh, you know, the DOJ or someone else needs to come out and say, we need additional authorities to charge these individuals that are doing these violent acts, and we don't think that we have those. I, don't, I haven't heard anyone say that yet. So. It almost feels like if we push a domestic terrorism statute, it's just it's for a feel-good perspective. Like it just it, it'll make us feel better to designate someone as a as a DT versus actually having any useful impact long run. Yeah, I think as Chad points out, there seems to be some need to label the act or the, or, or or organizations like we do with the foreign terrorist organizations. My 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 concern is that it becomes uh, political, that it's very subjective in terms of what is a domestic terrorist organization. And, you know, we can do this with foreign terrorist organizations because First Amendment and other, other civil lib liberties don't come into play as much. But um, when, you're, when you're talking about, there's a temptation to go after political rhetoric, to use the criminal, to almost weaponize the criminal justice system 
against your political enemies when you start talking about, well, you have a conspiracy theory about the election. That, that's fomenting terrorism. That's, in, you know, that's fomenting insurrection. Uh, if they, you don't like someone's pol particular political ideology, however odious it is, there, there's, I think it's very tempting to label those folks or those people as domestic terrorists, but even, even if they haven't, and especially if they haven't moved towards committing criminal acts or acts of violence. So I, um, I, I have no problem with a domestic the charge of committing a domestic terrorism act. Because I, we talk about it in the statutes, we define it. If you commit a violent act and your intent is to, to affect, uh, intimidate the civilian population or impact the government and influence the government through that violent act, I, I don't think I don't see any problem with having a statute that addresses the act as an act of domestic terrorism. We do that on the international terrorism side. There's a statute that talks about international terrorism, terrorism acts, but I don't like the idea of labeling criminal uh, organizations. Uh, or, or people necessarily as, quote, domestic terrorists. Ed, earlier this year, uh, the current Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas issued a memo about violent extremism within the ranks of DHS. What are your thoughts on that? Is that appropriate? And what does that do to the morale? Well, I, I can say that as acting secretary, I would never would have issued such a memo or a communication out to the field. I think what it, again, you have over 80,000 law enforcement professionals at the Department of Homeland Security. And I think essentially what you're saying, you know, when you issue that type of memorandum to the field is all of you are under investigation. There was no, there was no reason on why you need to investigate the ranks of DHS for, you know, for domestic terrorists. If you have reason to, if there's evidence, if you need to target, if you need to investigate, that's one thing. But there is no information given. It was just sort of this blanket uh, because it's going to make us feel better, um, you know, because all law enforcement, again, at that time, that was, I believe, back in April. Um, and at that time, it was the law enforcement and the military. Um, you know, we think there are, you know, domestic terrorists within those ranks. And so let's start to investigate. And I think it does a disservice uh, to the men and women of, of DHS that are doing their job every day to then somehow label them as potential domestic terrorists without any evidence, without anything other than it, it was a nice talking point. It was a nice headline uh, for the DHS secretary to say, look, this administration is real serious about this issue, uh, but I think it has long-term implications. And for a variety of different reasons, which probably not on topic to this, that you know, the men and women of DHS have lost confidence in their leadership at the department. And this is just another example of why that is. Chris, is the left looking at the right groups, or are we already down a slippery slope of uh, political opinion and association? Yeah, I think we are on a slippery slope because everything that I've seen produced under every document bulletin, threat bulletin, threat assessment I've seen produced under Secretary Mayorkas is, are, are pretty scary documents, pretty scary doctrine that he's putting out. You mentioned uh, the internal uh, search for, for domestic terrorists within DHS and the military. That goes dangerously, dangerously into First Amendment rights, and I think it's, it's, it can very quickly turn into a witch hunt if it hasn't already. I, you know, I see references in these bulletins to uh, we're going after, uh, we're going to go upstream and, and we're going we're to address online activities that deal with conspiracy theories and uh, discontent or criticism of the COVID policies of this, you know, of this government and, you know, the, uh, other, other types of political thoughts and political expressions that they think are a prelude to, to some act of domestic terrorism. It, it is extremely scary. I would invite anyone to p pull down those, the, the, the threat assessment and the most recent uh, bulletin that DHS has put out on domestic violent extremists where they, and, and how they plan to address that. Not so much how they define it, but how they plan to address it because they are, they are going very much into the area of First Amendment they're getting into political ideology. They're, I mentioned earlier weaponizing the criminal justice system. Uh, you, you see no mention of left-wing uh, domestic terrorists throughout 2020, and it's mentioned in, in uh, Chad's in the DHS 2020 threat assessment. We had 300 DHS officers attacked and injured 
in about a three-month period. We had over two, the major city police chiefs association documents over 2,000 injuries and assaults on police officers, over 200 arsons, 90 police cars torched, all kinds of violent acts, 16,000 arrests, taking over full city blocks by um, people who are advocating their political ideology. That is, that, that, for example, police are all racist. That's a political ideology. And I don't, I don't agree with it. A lot of people don't agree with it. But it's something that they were pushing on society through intimidation, through arson, through attacking police. That's domestic terrorism. But it, it's completely ignored and unaddressed in anything that I've seen produced by Homeland Security. I, what I'm saying, I'm not saying there isn't right-wing extremism. There most certainly is, and it's lethal. But it, you have to have a balanced approach to domestic terrorism, and that is not happening. And I, I, I continually use the phrase weaponizing the criminal justice system. DH and FBI have had tremendous power, and they need to wield that with balance, and I think they're facing a lot of political pressure. If you look at any congressional hearing lately, you see tremendous political pressure being placed on these agencies to look only at right-wing extremism. It's a great point that Chris brings up, and I think that's why a lot of the majority of Americans are, are tired of this rhetoric coming out of, out of D.C., particularly from the left, because what we saw in 2020 was, you know, for months at a time, businesses being burned, looted, people losing their livelihood, and the left not saying a thing, not lifting a finger, not to address anything. And then January 6th happens, and it's all they want to talk about. And so it goes back to the politicizing the issue. And I think they've lost a lot of credibility about really how to address and to, to talk about this, because they were absolutely silent when I was standing up, when others were standing up in the summer of 2020, saying this is a problem, that because you're not talking about it, because you're silent, you are, you are further incentivizing these types of groups to continue this behavior month after month after month. If you stand up and you talk about it and you condemn it as it should be condemned, that public narrative helps, uh, helps law enforcement and helps others uh, get that under control. But they did nothing about it. They said nothing about it the left, and you saw it continue month after month during the summer of 2020. And I think that's why a lot of them have lost a lot of credibility when now they're trying to talk about it, but as Chris said, only from the, the right wing perspective. Um, domestic terror, it, it's an issue. We need to address it. Violence is violence, whether it's coming from the right or the left. But you have to be, you have to talk about it equally, and you have to condemn it equally. Uh, otherwise, it becomes a political issue. The bulletin that Chris referenced just came out a few weeks ago from DHS. What are your thoughts on that? What should the audience know about it? Well, th there's been a couple of bulletins. They've issued a couple of them, and they keep updating them. And I think overall, if you were to look at those bulletins, you would see, you would think that the only threats to the homeland are domestic terrorists, right-wing domestic terrorists, and COVID. And that's not the case, right? Um, it's okay to put out a bulletin, which they did uh, here in August, talking about the anniversary of 9-11, right? We always see a heightened sense of uh, awareness around 9-11. That's completely appropriate, particularly as we talk about foreign terrorist organizations. And that's buried deeper into that bulletin, but it talks about uh, COVID and it talks about these domestic terrorists being inspired and, and the like. And I just, when you issue a bulletin, you want to put the most pressing information up front and, and then by them mentioning only domestic terrorism and COVID-related concerns, that's just not the threats facing the homeland. I mean, they are concerns, uh, but there are larger, more dire threats facing the homeland today. And I, I would have liked to have seen that, you know, really reflected in those bulletins. Let's take a question from uh, online audience from Annie. So I'll take a first shot at it. I, I think, obviously, that was a, a, a guidepost to 9-11 recommendations as the department was being stood up. And there's been a lot that's been executed under those recommendations, particularly from a screening and a vetting and, and how we look at individuals coming into the country. There's a lot that still needs to be done, particularly on the congressional oversight and consolidation and entry-exit. There's, there's a number of programs that, 
those that 9-11 recommendations called for that haven't been executed yet. So I think the sort of if I was given in a grade, I, it would be sort of a B. Uh, we've done a lot. We've come a long way. There's more to do. Um, I think now, probably 20 years later, it's, it's, it's probably a good time to go back and look at those recommendations and which ones haven't been fulfilled. Are they still um, relevant? Uh, do we still need those types? Or have we done other things that have addressed that vulnerability that they outlined there? So I think it's a, it's a good time to look at those. Yeah, I lived through that. I was the head of the FBI's criminal division uh, right after 9-11. And the WMD commission, I mean, one of, uh, the, the central theme of the commission was that we failed, the intelligence community failed to predict and prevent what happened on 9-11. And, and to a certain extent, they're right. Um, agencies were siloed. We had two systems. We had a FISA, you know, intelligence-centric uh, uh, set of procedures, a, a set of procedures on the criminal side. We had the FISA wall. I lived through that. We had a Hezbollah case in Charlotte where our criminal investigation and the investigators could not talk to the intelligence side, the counterterrorism side of that. Uh, they couldn't share the FISA uh, information that they were getting on this Hezbollah cell. So that's, that's been knocked down. We've seen a, you know, a much greater fusion between the CIA and the FBI when it comes to intelligence sharing. We have the National Counter, uh, NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, we have DHS stood up uh, with a, a significant role in coordinating intelligence with the fusion centers between state and local law enforcement and federal law enforcement. And the FBI has had, I, as head of the criminal division, overnight we lost about 1,500 agents to counterterrorism to stand up a much more intelligence-focused counterterrorism division and an intelligence division. They hired analysts, uh, thousands of analysts. They go through the FBI Academy at Quantico just like agents do. So, it, it, you know, there, there had been quite a few changes. They're a much more intelligence-focused agency in terms of getting to the left side of a terrorist, terrorism event uh, on the prevention side. And I could go on and on. I, I think we're in a, you know, international terrorism, I think success speaks for itself. We haven't had a terrorist attack in the United States since 9-11, except from some lone wolves who were inspired by, uh, by counter I mean, uh, international terrorist organizations. They can still project them th themselves that way. But we have, I think, as a whole, we've been very successful in preventing terrorist attacks here. So given recent events and, and ongoing events in Afghanistan, uh, does that priority shift? What, what should the priorities be now? Let's start with you, John. Sure. I, you know, one of my concerns, uh, there's a variety of different concerns about um, sort of the disastrous nature in which we withdrew from Afghanistan. but. The primary concern is what, you know, if the Taliban is reconstituting a new government there, do, are they going to continue to provide safe harbor for terrorist organizations, ISIS-K or others? And what does that do in the medium uh, to long run for the security of the homeland? Look, we had a difficult time when we had boots on the ground, when we had a diplomatic mission there of understanding what these groups were doing there in the country. You remove all of our diplomatic presence, our intelligence capability there, and I think that that's going to be a black hole, and we're not going to know what's going on there until it's too late. And whether they have the ability to strike the homeland uh, again in that medium term, I think that's, that's what we are going to have to figure out um, and hopefully guard against. But that's a concern today that wasn't a concern six months ago. Um, and so I think the events in Afghanistan have shifted the narrative here a little bit that you're going to have to have a whole U.S. government approach of what do these foreign terrorist organizations, are they going to have the ability to reach the U.S. Uh, here in the, in the medium to short term where they never really had that capability over the last 10, 15 years? Um, and I think that's, that's my primary concern at the moment because if they do, if they do have, you know, the desire and they start to gather the ability, well, we know that they have a blueprint on how to get into the United States, and that's through that southwest border. Which we can't forget is... Right. Is wide open. Chris, what are your thoughts on, on current priorities now? Yeah, I, I'm afraid that maybe we've taken our eye off the ball a little bit. I mean, those of us that lived through 9 11, it's in our brains. You know, thousands of people killed because of the first responders and 15 F died since then from working the, uh, working the, the, the crime scenes, if you will. 
we we have created, you know, one of the reasons we've been successful is because we've gone upstream to find terrorists outside our, our, our borders, and we've disrupted them in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I, as an FBI agent, was sent to Iraq in 2003 with a team to find terrorists, who, foreign fighters who were being picked up on the battlefield and uh, gather intelligence from them. And I think we, we've been extremely successful in going into their backyard and, and working with, with local uh, indigenous authorities there and developing eyes on the ground and human sources on the ground. Which there's no substitute for human sources. We now, don't, we now have lost that in that entire region, in my opinion, which is a notorious safe haven for terrorists. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they, have, they had a strong presence there. That's why we went there, Al-Qaeda in particular. Um, we, we did tremendous, uh, we, we, did, we disrupted their operations. We, we got bin Laden. It, I think the proof is in the fact that we have not experienced a, a serious attack in the United States. But now we are completely blind in that region. Uh, we saw 5,000 uh, prisoners released in Bagram. They weren't all Taliban. That, uh, well over a thousand of them were foreign fighters, people who came there to fight jihad. So the, the lo in the long term, and that's what they look. That's how international terrorists look at things. They look at it in the long term. They want to establish a caliphate across the globe, and they, and they they don't care how long it takes to do it. So if we take our eye off that ball, uh, we had a, an attack in '93 on the World Trade Center. They weren't successful. Guess what? They came back in 2001, eight years later, and they will continue to come at us. If we, if we don't remain vigilant, and I think we just gratuitously gave up all the eyes and ears that we have in that entire region. Uh, and I would just underscore what Chris said. The foreign fighters returning from the battlefield, we saw that in Iraq and Syria. And how do you guard against that? Not just coming back to the United States, but going to allies, the UK, Western Europe, and others that then can easily come to the US. And we were, we were pretty good, but we were able to do that because we had a lot of assets there, because we had a lot of intelligence. And when you don't have that now in Afghanistan and others, and as Chris said, those individuals are now um, thinking they can leave that battlefield and, and go back. And that's the concern. And so, again, a lot of what the department does, DHS does, is try to push out some of our screening and vetting capabilities to some of our partner nations, not only in that region, which there are a few, uh, but also in, in Europe and, and elsewhere, where we know they are transiting. We, we know some of their travel patterns and how they want to get to the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so we, we need to continuously guard against that. So I agree with Chris that that's the core competency. That's what the Department of Homeland Security does. It's what a lot of our mission is built off of. And I, I, I would be concerned that we're getting a little bit away from that and more into some of these newer threats, which are, again, are threats. But you've got to continue to look at the threats holistically and making sure that you're putting enough time and energy to address all of them across the board. Do you have another question? Yes. Um, Chad, you briefly mentioned it earlier, but um, how dangerous is the crisis on our southern border uh, with regard to transnational criminals and pos possible terrorists coming into the U.S. now? So we talk about it in, the, in our 2020 Homeland Threat Assessment about transnational criminal organizations, or TCOs. And I think it's important to keep in mind, and unfortunately, I don't know that the American people really view this as a threat because we've, we've lived with it for so long. It's just part of the nature. You're always going to have drugs coming across the border. There's always going to be violence. I, I don't accept that premise. Uh, these, this group specifically, the Mexican cartels, are getting more and more emboldened, are becoming more and more enriched off of some of the policies that we have here in the United States. And so that border... When you have 200,000 illegal apprehensions in one month, in a 30-day period alone, is astronomically high, and, it, and each one of those individuals is paying the Mexican cartels between five and $10,000. So they're, they're earning millions of dollars a day, which then, again, they put back into their criminal enterprise. They can uh, smuggle and traffic illegal narcotics and the like. And so I've said, and I'll continue to say, that the current policies of this administration continue to embolden these TCOs. We should be, our, our job should be defeating them. Instead, we're actually making them stronger and stronger and stronger uh, by this continued human smuggling chain that is going on that southwest border. So what do you have today? You have the number of illegal apprehensions and people being smuggled, all-time high. Illegal narcotics, increase in fentanyl over 200% in April, all-time high. 
And so there needs to be uh, a really a comprehensive view of how do we address the situation along that border. And I would say is there's a roadmap. We produced a roadmap in 2019 and 2020 for the Biden administration. Unfortunately, they put it in the trash can as they came in for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but there's a roadmap there. They can, they can dust that off. There are, there are policies that you can put in place. If Congress isn't going to help you and it doesn't look like they are, there's executive authorities that you can put in place that addresses this situation and really starts to target those transnational criminal organizations. As we um, are evacuating Afghanis from Afghanistan and either bringing them directly here to the U.S. or, or to third countries for, for, for further vetting, we're trying to uphold you know, our humanitarian values, uh, but in the rush to, to evacuate so many people so quickly, do you have vetting concerns, particularly for those who just came straight here? I, I do. I think it's important, and, and you said it, Laura, we need to be compassionate. We need to be compassionate about the people that helped us in Afghanistan, but we have to balance that with the security of the American people. And so we know that the SIV vetting is a complex vetting system. It takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months to vet these individuals. And now we're vetting thousands of them uh, in a matter of days and maybe, and maybe weeks. And we know from previous data that about 80 percent of those that apply for SIV uh, for those visas don't actually qualify for them at the end of the day. Um, and so I would like to see all this vetting done overseas at uh, safe third countries before they're brought here to the U.S. Because as you know, we're bringing a lot of individuals here on parole. We're paroling them in and then we're doing the checks on the back end. And all it takes is one or two or three of these individuals to somehow leave a military base. Um, they can't keep them there. Um, they can leave. And it only takes, you know, a handful of these folks that are bad actors to get away uh, and to have that whole system compromised. Um, and I think this just points to the, the chaotic withdrawal of Kabul, uh, no plan in place, because if there was a plan, then we would have vetted these individuals long before having to pop up military, you know, temporary facilities on military installations. Um, again, it's another crisis, this vetting crisis that we have now, it's another crisis that didn't need to occur. Um, had there been better planning and better foresight by the administration. What is uh, your familiarity with, with vetting by FBI for, for refugees or for other uh, groups that are being evacuated right now? Yeah, I think the vetting on, on our end is, is something that, you know, it has, has been done for years and years. I mean, do a national agency check. You check all the agency databases. Uh, and, you know, there, even still, some of those databases are siloed, and, and it takes time to do that. I've tried to bring people in on a special interest visa who were helping us in a, you know, drug cartel case, for example, or a, or a terrorism case in the case of Hezbollah. And it's a difficult process because of the, the, the thorough vetting that takes place. My concern is on the other end. Uh, the, the records, you know, the chaotic nature of the government in Afghanistan, the records that they do have. By the way, I, you know, I know for a fact that, that we left behind our, our biometric system that uh, logged in all of the government employees or people that we employed and the Afghan government employed. So that's, you know, that's a problem right there. It's an entirely different problem. I have another fear, and that is that uh, if you left family behind, any family whatsoever, you're subject to being extorted. The Chinese do it all the time. The students that come here are not necessarily intelligence agents, but their mom and dad live back in China and they live in a you know, subsidized apartment, and they, therefore the Chinese government has leverage over them. So people who come here who have left family behind, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, can get them to do things that they wouldn't necessarily want to do, but they're being extorted and forced to do. So that, that's, a, that's a separate and distinct threat from just you know, bad actors just coming in. You don't even have to be a bad actor. I think you have to have people who may, may have left people behind who are, who are become uh, weapons of extortion. So I, I think it's, a, it's ripe with, um, with issues. As Chad points out, it only takes one. You know, we've seen with mass shootings and the types of, of things that have happened over here, these tragedies, it doesn't take a lot of technology to do it. You don't have to fly an airplane into World Trade Center to commit a serious terrorist attack just one or two people. Yeah, Chris brings up a, a good point. You know, trying to vet the amount of documents uh, that an SIV applicant has, you know, you're looking at an Afghan birth certificate or a passport 
then you have to get records that they actually worked for the military as an interpreter or a translator for 12 months. That was hard enough to do when we had a diplomatic mission, when we had a, an embassy there in Kabul where you had State Department employees. Now we have none of that. So how do you validate all of this? How do you go back to the records? How do you find um, you know, the military person that they may have worked with or not worked with when, when folks are now scattered all over the globe? And so I think there's some, going to be some real challenges as they try to vet these SIV uh, applicants going forward. Um, and it's, it's a concern. So I'd like to give the opportunity to both of you to, to give some closing remarks, uh, thoughts on 9-11, the anniversary that's coming up. And, and what would you say to young people? We, we've stayed safe now for 20 years, so an entire generation has, has grown up not, and they didn't experience what we did. So what would you say to, to young people in particular? Chris, we'll start with you. Yeah, that, that was uh, the most, one of the most significant events uh, of you know, the last 100 years if you will, it was it was a it was a an attack on our government, on our and our people, and it was it was highly successful by a determined, well-funded, well-trained terrorist organization that hasn't gone away, and and I still fear that we we 9/11 is just uh, a date for 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 my grandkids. I have eight grandkids. They have no concept of what happened on 9/11. We don't have a long institutional memory like they do, like the bad guys do, and we always have to keep in mind that that uh, they 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 take a long view of it, and international terrorism will continue to be a threat. I think we just sort of um, took the pressure off, if you will. We've given them some breathing room to reconstitute, and so I I, I just I would say the central theme here is on, on this anniversary of 9-11, let's not forget, and let's make sure that we keep our eye on international terrorism from a strategic standpoint. It's much, it, it is much more significant than the threat of domestic terrorism. And then the other things that uh, Chad and the DHS mentioned in that threat assessment, China is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, Russia, they want to see us go away. They want to see this country go away. They will do everything they can to make that happen, economically, militarily, uh, from a cyber standpoint. So the, so the threats that are mentioned in, in that report ought to be considered and front and center, and the American people, I think, so, uh, sometimes lose sight of that. And I think this administration needs to keep their eye on the ball on what the real threats are, there, the most significant threats are to this country and our homeland. I guess, you know, the anniversary for 9-11, what does that mean for me? It, it, it's a reminder that um, not only from 9-11, but during my time at the department the last four years, reading the intelligence, that there are individuals in this world that, that their sole mission is to harm Americans. And I don't think that can be understated or overstated enough. I think that, that people that have grown up in the last 20 years where we have been overseas fighting this war overseas, I don't think that they really understand that, that there are individuals out there that their entire mission is to somehow get here to the United States so that they can kill Americans. And that's what the Department of Homeland Security was created to, to prevent, along with FBI and our other partners. And so on an anniversary like 9-11, I think it's important to keep that in mind. I went to a, a university uh, several months ago and, and talked to a political science class. And my, one of my first questions was, who was alive on 9-11? And this was a freshman, sophomore class, or freshman, yeah, sophomore class. And two or three hands went up. Um, so these are folks that are, are now studying, you know, future leaders that weren't even born on 9-11. Um, and so they, they don't have a concept of, of what that means and how it feels to be hit and, and what that did to the American psyche. So for me, the anniversary is a reminder of there are bad people in this world that want to hurt Americans, kill Americans every single day. They don't like us. They don't like what we stand for. They don't like, you know, being the superpower. Chris talked about China, Russia, which we mentioned. And, you know, these are examples of that. But those are not the only two nations. There are individuals across the globe that, um, that want to see us fail. And, you, you know, we have a, a Department of Homeland Security. You have 240,000 individuals. The vast majority are trying to do the right thing every single day. Um, to, to make this homeland safer. And I think we owe them a, a, a you know, gratitude. We owe our other partners in law enforcement and across the government 
it's not just by happenstance that we haven't had another attack on the homeland. It's because a lot of hard work goes into it day in and day out that unfortunately the vast majority of Americans can't see, we can't talk about, we can't demonstrate uh, how we're protecting them. But uh, a simple thank you uh, to those people that are doing that job every day I think is warranted. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Thank you both for, for talking about uh, domestic terrorism, foreign terrorism, uh, as this important anniversary approaches, and um, particularly with domestic terrorism, it's just not something we are hearing enough about. So thank you both. And thank you to our audience for, for joining us. And as the anniversary of 9-11 approaches, please remember those who perished on 9-11, the military who protect us, and the first responders who always run to trouble.